Now, our subject for our session this morning is pneumatology and inerrancy, or as uh, most of us would say, the Holy Spirit and inerrancy. And I want us to uh, read a passage or two in the 13th through 17th chapters of John's Gospel. Be helpful to you, I think, if you have your Bible open there uh, or your technological Bible, if you use one. Uh, this message this morning uh, has, in theory, three points. Uh, if time flies, it will become a message with one point, uh, which in turn will be a message with five points. And uh, so, just to give you a road map, since uh, I've not been assigned, I'm one of the uh, I'm one of the ones whose lot has fallen in a hard place, who has not been assigned a text, but I do want to read a number of passages that at least will serve as the text for our first point this morning. So, John's Gospel, chapter 13, beginning to read in the first verse, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that His hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. And then probably just on the opposite page in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper, another paraclete, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him for He dwells with you and will be in you." That is to say, they knew Him because He dwelt in the Lord Jesus, and in that sense He was with them. And then following Pentecost, the very same Spirit, the very same Spirit, not another Spirit, would come as the Spirit of the Lord Jesus. That is to say, the Spirit who for now thirty-three years had dwelt on and in and ministered to and through the Lord Jesus. There is no other Holy Spirit who indwells believers but the Holy Spirit who was on the ministry and life of the Lord Jesus. That is why the Apostle Paul is able to say that Christ is all and in you all. So you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And then over the page, probably in chapter 15 and verses 26 and 27, 
but when the paraclete comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will bear witness about Me, and you also will bear witness, because you, we might add also, you have been with Me from the beginning. And in chapter 16 and verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is Mine. Therefore I said, that He will take what is Mine and declare it to you." And then in our Lord's Prayer in chapter 17 and verse 8, "'For I have given them the words that you gave Me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them." And then later on in the passage, I do not ask for, those, for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And then over in chapter 21 and verses 30 and 31, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Let us pray together. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we thank You that in Jesus Christ You have become our Father. You have adopted us into Your family as Your sons and given to us an inheritance with the saints. We thank You for the goal of Your predestination, that we should be conformed to the image of Your Son and that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. You have given us Your heart in Your Son, and now through Him You have also given us Your Holy Spirit. We thank You today for His ministry. We glorify Him together with You and with Your Son, and praise You for all that he was and did in companionship with our Lord Jesus Christ those years of the incarnation here upon the earth, and for our Savior's request of You that we might have that same Spirit that He knew, who accompanied Him, who dwelt upon His humanity and within Him, and enabled Him every single moment of His life, from conception in the womb to resurrection from the tomb to ascension to the throne. We praise You that You have given us Your best gift in Your Son and a like gift in Your Spirit, and that Your Son is now given to the apostles and to the whole church His own best gift in the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we pray together as we study Your Word and look to honor our Lord Jesus Christ that we may today in our studies neither be ignorant or neglectful of the blessed Holy Spirit. And so we pray 
that you would open our eyes that we may see wonderful things in your law. And we pray this for our Savior's sake. Amen. The Bible, the Holy Scriptures, come to us as a gift of the Holy Trinity. The Bible comes to us as a gift of the Holy Trinity, not the Father alone or the Son alone, or for that matter, the Holy Spirit alone, but a gift from the Blessed Trinity. Our forefathers in the Christian faith, when they spoke about the Trinity, believed that there were two fundamental principles enshrined in Scripture about the way in which God, the Trinity, communicates to us. First of all, that in everything God does, all three persons of the Trinity are operative. Creation would be a great illustration. The incarnation would be another illustration. The Father sends, the Son comes, and He is conceived in the power of the Holy Spirit. The death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the ascension, the gift of the Holy Spirit about which Jesus speaks here in His farewell discourse. As they put it in Latin, the opera trinitatis ad extra, the external works of the Trinity sunt indivisa. They are indivisible. They work in harmony, this one God in three persons. But along with that, they emphasized what they called the doctrine of the appropriations. That is to say that each person in the Trinity engages in a distinct way, a unique way, in a way that neither the other two persons especially engage in in bringing salvation to us. Probably 25% of the ministers in this room as young ministers have begun praying to the Heavenly Father and within five minutes have been thanking Him for coming to die for us on the cross. And we all instinctively recognize that not deliberately we have found ourselves uttering an ancient heresy. And it causes us to reflect or should that we can never thank the Father for dying for us on the cross, for He did not, neither can we thank the Holy Spirit for doing so. Only the Son can be thanked for dying for us on the cross, and only the Father can be praised for sending Him, and only the Spirit can be praised for His particular ministry to Him. And this principle applies, obviously, also to the Scriptures. The Scriptures are given to us in the design of the Father, and in this book He addresses us as sons, as we read in Hebrews 12, interestingly citing from the third chapter of the book of Proverbs. He addresses us, present tense, as sons. And Christ speaks in the Scriptures. His sheep in this book, hear His voice, recognize His accent. Through it, He calls them by name. And it is also true, as it seems to me our Lord Jesus is teaching His apostles in this particular section of Scripture, that the Holy Spirit has His own role to play as the executive of the Godhead, as the one who, in a sense, puts the finishing touches to divine revelation as well as to our personal salvation. And it is on this that our Lord Jesus is concentrating in these words. We recognize, of course, that the Scriptures underline for us many places in the New Testament that the Holy Spirit is the one who speaks through the pages of the Old Testament. Not only so, but uh, one of the emphases of Peter when he speaks about the, the ministry of prophecy, you remember, in the Old Testament Scriptures in 1 Peter chapter 1, 
is the way he identifies the executive of the Old Testament Scriptures with the very Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Christ indwelling the prophets, spoke about Christ, even though leaving the authors of the Old Testament prophecies somewhat mystified by who this was or when He would come. And Jesus confirms this. For example, in Mark chapter 12 and verse 36, that the Old Testament Scriptures are the voice of God carried on the breath of God, that is to say, the Holy Spirit. He is the pneuma, the ruach of God. And so the whole of the Old Testament Scriptures comes to us, as it were, born on the breath of God, carried, as Peter will say, by the Spirit of God to the people of God. But we sometimes forget, I think, or ignore the fact that our Lord Jesus not only had a particular view of the Old Testament Scriptures, but our Lord Jesus Christ also had a distinct view of the New Testament Scriptures that would be written. And that's hugely significant, isn't it? For at the end of the day, Christ Himself is our Lord and Master, our canon, and He has put His imprimatur on the pages of the Old Testament Scriptures. But it's vital for us, I think, to understand that especially towards the end of His ministry, as He engages in commissioning the apostles for their ministry, the Lord Jesus is putting His divine imprimatur on the pages of the New Testament as well. This is not a surprising development that comes to the mind of the apostles once they have been going for some time. It's time we wrote these things down, as is a very characteristic view of the New Testament Scriptures. But this, in one sense, is the very reason why Jesus called these men, why He trained these men, and why He appointed these men to be eyewitnesses, as Luke tells us in the gospel, chapter 24, in verse 8 of chapter 1 of the Acts of the Apostles. These men, this company, received the Holy Spirit whom Jesus asked from the Father. They, in particular, received the Holy Spirit with, among other things, in view that they would become the prophets, the spokesmen of God, the spokesmen of Jesus for the new age. New age, new prophets. New age, new sent ones, now designated, as we find in the New Testament, as apostles. And I want us to try and camp down this morning on three aspects of the way in which Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to the apostles, particularly with the inspiring of Scripture, the divine breathing out of Scripture, and that that breathing out through the apostles should be characterized as the Old Testament Scriptures were viewed both by Jesus and by the apostles, as the very truth of God that is without error. So, first of all, I want us to try and think together about this axiom that the sending of the Spirit to the apostles is in order to give the word of truth to the church. John 13, through the end of the gospel, has often been described in contrast to the first half, the book of signs, as the book of glory. Perhaps the best way of expressing this is found in Calvin's introduction to his commentary on John's gospel when he contrasts John with the synoptic gospels and says the other gospel shows Christ's body. John's gospel shows us Christ's soul. And here now Judas has gone 
into the darkness. Immediately, Jesus' own spirit seems to be suffused with a kind of sense of relief now that He can speak to His own, whom He has secured, none of whom He will lose. And His soul is bared to them. This is the supreme section in Scripture where Jesus, as it were, opens heaven to tell us about the wonder of the Father's love and sending and the glory of the Spirit's coming and ministry. And within that, within that broad context, the supreme passage in all Scripture on the blessed Trinity it's within this context that Jesus begins to explain to His apostles that He is sending His Spirit to them in particular in order that they may give the word of truth to the church. We are familiar in general with the pattern of Jesus' speech here. John 13, 3, the Father has sent the Son and has committed all things to the Son. John 14, verse 16, the Son will ask the Father to send the Spirit, the event to which Peter alludes in his Pentecost sermon. Pentecost means that a hidden event has taken place in glory. The Son has gone to the Father and said, you promised, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Impossible unless the gift of the Spirit is given then let us send the Spirit. And Peter explains to the crowds that what they see is an open window into that blessed inner Trinitarian transaction that has taken place. And so Jesus says in chapter 16, verse 4, when the Spirit comes, He will take what is Christ's, what is Christ's is what has been given Christ by the Father. So, He will take what the Father has given to the Son. Think of the prayer in John 17, the words you gave me. The Spirit now comes, and in His glorifying of the Lord Jesus Christ, He shows the fullness and majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ to us. And it's, as it were, surrounding that. It's, as it were, answering for us the question, how do we see this? That Jesus is here preparing and promising to His apostles that He has called them in order that they may be the new prophets, the sent ones of the Father who sent the Son, who sent the Spirit, who now sends the apostles to give the Bible, the new covenant, to the people of God. And so, although naturally when we read these chapters, we, we think of them largely in terms of the soteriology that they teach, uh, what Christ by the Spirit will do in the apostles and then in us subjectively, uh, the one who loves Him will be loved by the Father, and the Father and the Son will come and make their home with us. But there is this other strand, not so much soteriology, but as we might say more technically, bibliology. And I want, if you're able, I know we're on the last day of the feast, but if you're able to follow through five stages in what Jesus is saying to the apostles in the upper room as He shows them His soul. Stage number one is this. Jesus is giving them the Spirit to empower them to be His spokesman. The Spirit will come to empower the apostles to be the spokesman of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the Amen saying in chapter 13, first in verse 16, but then in verse 20, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. 
Now, Jesus is here making His apostles the prophets of the new covenant. This is exactly what it meant to be a prophet in the Old Testament. You remember in Exodus when Moses argues with uh, the Lord about his inability to speak, and eventually the Lord says, then I will make Aaron your prophet, and your words will go in Aaron's mouth, and he will speak for you, so that when he speaks, you're the one who speaks. And when you speak, I am the one who speaks. And this is what Jesus is now saying to His apostles. Whoever receives someone I send receives me. In Jesus' culture, there was a, there was a name for that, shaliach, H-A-S-H-A-L-I-A-C-H, if you want to write it down in English. The shaliach, it was said, was as the man himself. This in passing seems to me the solvent of the conundrum of who went to Jesus to get help for the centurion's servant, where the gospels say two different things, don't they? One, the whole story focuses on the centurion. The other, the whole story focuses on the elders. What's the… What, I mean, why was that not so glaringly obviously a contradiction to the gospel writers? because they understood that a shaliach, a man empowered by others, spoke as the man himself. And it's within that cultural context that that paradox, if not actually contradiction, begins to resolve itself. It's one of those illustrations where people will say, look, there's a contradiction there, and we are convinced there are no contradictions in Scripture, but we may not yet know what the solvent of the apparent contradiction is. And lo and behold, here we find it in the culture. I guess our nearest equivalent would be power of attorney. If you are a power of attorney, for all practical purposes, you have all the authority of the person whose power of attorney you have. Now, that's what the word apostle means. Apostolos is Jesus' shaliach. Apostolos is Jesus' power of attorney. That is why it is not an embarrassment to us as gospel people to read John 20, 23, if you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. That's too much for us until we understand the Lord Jesus is empowering these particular individuals to be His prophets, to be His spokesmen, to put His words into their mouths. And this becomes the strand that runs through the Lord's teaching in the upper room, especially after Judas leaves. Jesus has been sent as the shaliach of the Father. The words He speaks are not His own words. They are the words He has heard from the Father. The Holy Spirit is sent as Jesus Shaliah. He is Alos Parakletos, in that context undoubtedly another paraclete of precisely the same kind as the Lord Jesus Himself who comes entirely with Jesus' authority. And then Jesus' Spirit is sent by the Lord Jesus in the name of the Father to the apostles, to apostle them, to make them the, the, the Navi'im of the Lord Jesus, to make them His Shaliakim, and to empower them to speak on His behalf. So, stage number one is that Jesus is giving the Spirit to the apostles to empower them as His spokesman. The second stage is this that the Spirit comes to the apostles 
specifically to equip them to give, may I put it this way, to give the New Testament to the church. Look at what Jesus says in chapter 14 and verse 26, for example. He says, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in My name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And then turn over to 1613. Jesus says, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on His own authority. Well, He's God. Why should He not speak on His own authority? Well, within the context, you understand the Father has sent the Son, and the Son brings the words of the Father, and now the Son sends the Spirit. This is a very remarkable saying. I have much to teach you, many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when the Spirit comes, He says, He will guide you into all truth because He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. Now, in these few verses, in essence, we have the vision for the New Testament, don't we? Bringing to remembrance the story that's in the Gospels and the words, leading them into all truth. And what are the epistles? And indeed, in some senses, the Acts of the Apostles, if they are not the Spirit leading the apostles to understand the significance of the one whose story is told in the Gospels. And whatever your particular take on the book of Revelation might be, it certainly does include some things that are still to come, doesn't it? So, these are not random sayings of the Lord Jesus. And there's something else to notice that perhaps I can put this way. He isn't speaking to you. He isn't speaking about you. You weren't there. <laughs> and you see, we never really understand what Jesus is doing here when we go to this passage and we simply assume everything Jesus says, He says in the same way to me. You know, we don't teach our people, uh, even if they are rich, to go and sell everything they have. We don't read that text that way. But there is an almost incurable disease in our subculture to read this text that way. The Spirit will lead me into all truth. The Spirit will show me things to come. He's not speaking about us. We were not there. He is speaking to the apostles. And if we don't grasp that, we'll not see that what He's doing is saying, the Spirit is going to come, and He's going to breathe out Scripture through you, through this community. And so, our second stage is this, as Jesus makes plain in chapter 16 and 12 and 13, there is an economic unity between the Son and the Holy Spirit with respect to Scripture. I have said many things to you. They're all in the Gospels. Let me correct that. Many of them are in the Gospels. But there are still things you need to learn and my shaliach, my power of attorney, my spirit, will be as I myself have been to you as He leads you further into all the truth. So, if stage one is Jesus gives the Spirit to empower the apostles as His spokesman, the second stage is He very specifically gives the Spirit to the apostles to equip them to give the New Testament Scriptures to the church. The third stage is this. The Spirit comes, says Jesus, and He says this again and again and again. 
the Spirit who will come in this particular ministry will come as the Spirit of truth in order to guarantee the infallibility, the authenticity, the incorrigibility, or if you will, the inerrancy of what He gives to the church as the shaliach of Jesus in empowering the apostles to be His shaliach. Notice again how He speaks of the Spirit as the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. Isn't that beautiful? Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. So, like what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, isn't it? It neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him, and He's the Spirit of truth. And 1526, the Spirit will come who proceeds from the Father, and He will bear witness about me. He is the Spirit of truth, says Jesus in verse 26. And as the Spirit of truth, verse 13 of chapter 16, He will lead the apostles into all truth, so that ultimately when our Lord Jesus… You know when you preach, what do you do when you pray at the end of preaching? Don't you gather up the ministry, the the burden of the ministry, and pray at home? And this is precisely what Jesus does, isn't it, in chapter 17, when, he, when he, he brings this burden to His heavenly Father and He lays it before Him. In chapter 17, verse 17, He prays, sanctify them in the truth. Your Word is truth. And now as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world with the words I heard from you that they have heard from me, and they have received them. And the possibility of the Spirit of God lying is equal to the Father lying to the Son. That's what Jesus is saying. And then the Son lying to the apostles. That's what it means for Him to be the Spirit of truth. And that is why, of course, earlier on in the gospel, as as we heard in the opening address, the Lord Jesus contrasts truth with the lie. It isn't just truth is reality by comparison with shadow. It is that truth is contrasted with lie as utterly and wholly and permanently reliable. And what is so fascinating in this context is there are one or two occasions in this farewell discourse when Jesus alludes to the Old Testament, doesn't He? He says it's impossible that these Scriptures would not be fulfilled. Why? Because they're utterly reliable, because they're without error. Do you see how utterly… One would need to be lacking in what people call emotional intelligence to think that Jesus, who looked back to the Old Testament Scriptures that pointed to Him, would now be promising the apostles would write an errant Scripture which displayed the fulfillment of those Old Testament promises. The inevitable logic of Jesus affirming the inerrancy of the Old Testament Scriptures is that the Scriptures that He will give through His apostles will at the very least be at least as inerrant, because they come from the one who is the Spirit of truth. I think we need to take this with all seriousness, don't we? Uh, Think of what happened in Acts chapter 5 to those who lied to the Holy Spirit. Do you think if that is the judgment that comes from God on those who lie to the Holy Spirit? that the Holy Spirit would lie to the church. As to the testimony of the Lord Jesus and the testimony of the New Testament, there is no question whatsoever. To fail to grasp this is to fail to have any sense of the connectedness of the Word of the gospel that's given to us in the Scriptures of the New Testament. The Holy Spirit has no bad breath, my brothers. 
So, here is the fourth stage, and this message is rapidly becoming a one-point, five-point message. It is this work of the Spirit that Jesus' prayer in John 17 makes effectual in the apostles and in the world. I've already given hints of this, says Jesus in chapter 17, verse 8. I'm praying for them. This is the section when He's praying no longer for Himself but for the apostles. They're the only ones in the room. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom You have given Me. Actually, in John's gospel, his favorite way of describing them, it's beautiful, isn't it? No wonder he, no wonder he is so patient with them. They're the ones the Father has given to him. He says, I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world. They are yours. All mine are yours, and yours, he says, are mine. Now, what is it that's characteristic about them? Well, back in verse 8, I have given them the words. Notice the plural, incidentally. I think Ian Hamilton alluded to the servant song, morning by morning, he awakens me, he awakens my ear. I heard him as one who was taught. I, what can this mean? Will we one day know what this means? I have given them the words, plural, that you gave me, and they have received them and they have believed, and I am praying for them. But then this, I have given them these words, and then this, verse 18, as you sent me into the world with your words, so I have sent them into the world with my words and I am consecrating myself for them that they also may be sanctified in this truth. And then you notice as He comes to the whole church of God in every age, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in Me through their Word. Now, there's one further stage, and it's this, that against that background, it certainly looks to me as though John himself understands that John's gospel is itself part of the answer to that prayer. Look at the words with which essentially the gospel comes to a climax. It's got a, it's got a prologue and it's got an epilogue. But in a sense, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31 are the, are the climax of the teaching of the gospel of John. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written, gegraptai, which is the characteristic way of speaking about the sacred Scriptures. Ah, but you can't uh, place that much weight on a word. Well, perhaps on this word you can, because look at what he says. The Apostle John says, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. You see, the Father has given the words to the Son. The Son has given both His Spirit and His Word. It's fascinating, isn't it? Spirit and Word given together by the Lord Jesus. The Son has given the Spirit and the Word, and He's then gone to pray, Father, I am praying for those who will come to believe through their Word. These things are written, says John, that you may believe through this Word. Just in parenthesis, brothers, the idea that the apostles were ignorant of the fact that they were giving authoritative Scripture to the New Testament church is utterly indefensible 
in the light of a careful reading of the New Testament. And here's one of the illustrations. You know, scholars can be like Christians, reading, reading the New Testament as though it were just an isolated series of statements flung around. But when, you, when, when the word of John's gospel is into you, you see where the flow is going here. This is why this is the climax. This is, this is what John was appointed to do. This is what Jesus has prayed for John, among others. At the end of the day, that prayer of Jesus implies that there would be a New Testament, actually. How else could the Word be guaranteed to go to every nation and last in its authenticity through history? And John is very conscious that what he is doing here is actually he's almost… the pen is almost done now. The paper, the, it's running out. He's room for, for perhaps another chapter, and he's about to put his pen down and he's reflecting what a moment this must have been in the Apostle John's life. Jesus' prayer is answered in this book. It is written that others may believe that Jesus' prayer may be answered. Were you converted through John's gospel? Then here is the story. The Father gave the words to the Son, the Son sent the Spirit as His shaliach to the apostles. One of those apostles was the Apostle John, and he had received the words that the Father gave to the Son, and he labored to, to write this down. How, how, how would this poor man find the, the finances needed for the, even the writing materials? And now, now he's almost finished. What a what a moment for a disciple of Jesus Christ to understand that I've seen at least the beginning of the answer to Jesus' prayer. We don't know what other parts of the New Testament John the Apostle knew or had access to, but here he knows that this design of Jesus, when he opened his heart to them in the upper room, this design of Jesus has been fulfilled and what He has given to the church, and this is just one of many illustrations, is the word of truth that is as reliable as any word that the Heavenly Father ever speaks to His Son. So, you see, while there is not the language of inerrancy used in the New Testament in relation to the sacred Scriptures of the New Covenant, its very existence depends on a theology of inerrancy, because at the end of the day, it, it, it is, yes, it is in a sense, as we often say, not to believe in the inerrancy of Scripture is to make God a liar. But you see, what John is teaching us, what a thing to have been able to snuggle up to the Lord Jesus, who was from all eternity in the bosom of the Father, and realize that the very words you had written reflected the sending of the Spirit, the sending of the Son, and the words that the Father had spoken to His Son. My dear brothers, it's, it's not just the integrity of the text of Scripture that is at stake in the inerrancy of Scripture. It's the, it's the integrity, not just of God as a block. It's the very integrity of the interrelationships among the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Father does not lie to His Son. The Son does not lie to the Spirit. The Spirit does not lie to the apostles. And this, of course, is, this is what creates the consciousness in the apostles of the utter reliability and authority of what they write. I think about what Paul says right at the end of Romans when he speaks about the mystery that has been kept secret for long ages 
but now has been disclosed through the prophetic writings. Now, in the now, now is an eschatological noon for the Apostle Paul. In the new age, it's all been revealed. It wasn't disclosed to us through the Old Testament Scriptures in its fullness and clarity, but now it is through the prophetic writings. You see, prophetic writings and apostolic writings, they go hand in hand. This is Paul's version of precisely what Peter says when he talks about Paul's letters and places them in connection with the other Scriptures. And this is the reason why in the New Testament church the apostles could say, as uh, the Apostle Paul says, uh, make sure this letter is read in your church. Make sure your letter, this letter is read. Now, I love the letters of Robert uh, Murray McChain and Samuel Rutherford, but if I read them in the church to which I belong, let us hear the Word of God first from the book of Nehemiah and a letter from the letters of Samuel Rutherford. I hope I am instantaneously removed those two things do not belong together. And here in these new churches where the Scriptures of the old are being read, alongside that, as Peter clearly had some collection of Paul's letters, the Word of God through the apostles is being read. And if there were any dubiety about that, we just need to listen to what this is why the Apostle Paul had to fight for his apostleship. It wasn't just that his role was under attack, it was his consciousness that he was giving Scriptures to the church were under attack. So, if anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Or to these baby Christians in the church in Thessalonica, where he writes to them so sweetly and yet with such firmness, if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person. I've nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. How does he have the arrogance to say this kind of thing? Because he understood the Father had given words to the Son, the Son had given words through the Spirit to the apostles, and he was one of the apostles. Well, let me simply make some application of all this, and I apologize to the translators that they have worked hard on points two and three, and they alone know precisely what those points actually are. <laughs> I was reared under a ministry as a young teenager when I first came to Christ at the age of 14. I was reared uh, under a ministry that, that uh, in many ways brought great blessing to my life. I owe my late minister of my early teenage years a great debt for his ministry to my mum and dad. I heard some of the greatest truths of the gospel from his lips. But when I was, I think, 17 and drifting, he suspected, towards Reformed theology and had come from my little study of Scripture to believe that this Word of God was utterly inerrant and utterly reliable. He took me aside one day, and he said, Sinclair, your doctrine of Scripture doesn't really make any difference when it comes to the preaching of Scripture. And I felt a pain in my soul, and I thought to myself, my dear minister, I'm convinced you're wrong but I do not have a shred of evidence outside of the pages of the Scriptures to demonstrate that you are wrong. That was fifty years ago, and I have fifty years of experience 
of hearing the difference in the accent in preaching that rests on the conviction that this is God-breathed Scripture and is therefore utterly without error because it comes to us through the Spirit, from the Son, and in the gift of the Heavenly Father. We are all enormously grateful for the way in which we've been served here. But why have we been served here this way? Because the 1,250 who have been to us as fragments of the image of our Lord Jesus Christ are those who, in public and in private, have been able to gaze through the Word with unveiled faces on the glory of the Lord in His inerrant Word, and by the Spirit who breathed out that Word, have been transformed already into the likeness of Jesus from one degree of glory to another. My mother, who was full of all kinds of wise sayings, who had not, an un, not a prejudiced bone in her body, except when it came to the eating of oatmeal, <laughs> which, as you know, tastes a great deal better with sugar than it does with salt. Mother, why can we not today have sugar on our porridge? Because that's the way the English eat porridge. <laughs> but among her wise sayings were these. Some of them I still don't understand. The proof of the pudding is in the eating thereof. Why is it when we go to one another's churches, we recognize the same reality? The ultimate proof of the gospel is not to be found in our experience, but a normal proof of the denial of the gospel becomes evident in the experience of the people, and chiefly inerrancy matters, because it honors the Holy Spirit who wants to honor the Son, who has come to honor the Father. And so we honor the Blessed Trinity best, and worship and glorify the Spirit, the author and giver of life, together with the Father and the Son best. When we trust the inerrancy of the Word He has given, and when we realize it inerrantly points us to the Lord Jesus Christ, whom we love and whom we worship. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for the gospel of God and for the Word that You have given to us. We have been singing that our tongues are poor and stammering but also that the day will come when all the ransomed church of God will be saved to sin no more. And we pray that through our ministry of this Word that You have entrusted to us not as apostles but as pastors and teachers, that our ministry of this Word may be used by You, that others may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior, the Son of the living God, and the Lord, that His church may be built to the ends of the earth and to the end of the age. And we pray that You would keep us true and confident and enable us as we pour over the sacred Scriptures to read these words as the very words that the Father has given to His Son and that the Son has given through the Spirit to the apostles and that the apostles have given to us, that our Savior's prayer may be answered through our ministry, that there may be many who will believe through the Word that You have given. And this we pray together, asking that You would cover our many sins and failures, 
for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.